I'm Tom. If you're new here, my reviews are all about great insight and photography. Plus, I won't waste your time. Hope you enjoy the reviews as much as I like making them. If there was an electric car in your garage 15 years ago, it probably had a Fisher Price Power Wheels badge on it. Now, nearly every major automobile manufacturer is electrifying their lineups. Audi offers up the e-tron, a five passenger SUV sold with both traditional roofline and this raked sport back. Unlike a toy car, it's quick, holds five passengers comfortably, plus has a suspension and a roof. EVs have come so far. Audi is part of the Volkswagen family, as is Porsche. And if you're wondering if e-tron and Taycan share an architecture, the answer is no. At least for now, that will change with the e-tron GT. This one doesn't get Porsche's 270 kilowatt charging rate, but e-tron juices up fairly fast with an EPA rated range of 218 miles. It accepts commercial 150 kilowatt charging and with it, e-tron goes from spent to 80% in a half hour or so. A full charge with home level two takes from nine to 10 hours, you know, while you're sleeping. Tesla's charging infrastructure still rules, but Volkswagen-owned Electrify America is improving quickly, and there are others like ChargePoint and EVgo. Like all electric cars, e-tron pricing starts on the high side. A standard roof model now begins at around $67,000. Sportback adds a premium of $3,200. Still, that's easily $35,000 less than a base Taycan 4S. This 2020 mid-tier premium plus edition in Manhattan Gray retails for 80 grand before any state and federal incentives. With Uncle Sam's 7,500, e-tron Sportback is $3,000 less than Q. As far as drive goes, each axle gets its own motor, the rear unit being more powerful, e-trons are strictly all-wheel drive. Now, you can't see the motors with the hood open, I did this to show that there's a tiny little frunk, nothing much though. By default, there's 355 horsepower and 414 pound-feet of torque. Boost mode, I think Marshawn Lynch would like that name, bumps that to 402 horses and 490 pound-feet. About the only thing heard on startup is... This is NPR. There's a 95 kilowatt hour pack with 86.5 kilowatt hours usable. Naturally, it's mounted low in the floor for a low center of gravity, and it's very aerodynamic. There's no real transmission. These are for adjusting the regeneration drag. I didn't notice much of a difference. The controller requires deliberate action to select drive or reverse with a distinct warning tone. Not sure I'd go four-wheeling with an e-tron, but Audi Drive Select has off-road modes that trigger the air suspension to add as much as two inches of lift, or can lower it by an inch at highway speeds for efficiency. Electric cars, of course, they sound different. Here is what the e-tron sounds like under hard acceleration. Nothing science fiction-y, just kind of electric car-y. If you want your vehicle to sound like the Jetsons ride or make fart noises, Mr. Musk is happy to accommodate. In its most powerful mode, the e-tron will do the zero to 60 dash in five and a half seconds. It's not the fastest electric vehicle out there, but EVs by their very nature have a lot of low end torque, so they feel faster than they are. Really, the e-tron feels punchy and fun. Visibility is fine, the greenhouse is a bit on the narrow side. E-tron doesn't ride especially high, which makes it easy to get in and out of, and you won't get a nosebleed from behind the wheel. The driving position is very natural. For the most part, the e-tron feels light on its feet, but uh, this is no featherweight. It weighs 5,800 pounds. That is about the weight of a well-equipped F-150 Super Crew. Not light. There's some road feel coming up through the wheel, not gobs and gobs, but for a heifer, the e-tron is remarkably composed when pushed into corners. 
When it comes to ride quality, e-tron is on the firmer side of comfortable. And one thing about this vehicle, it's really quiet. In fact, I can whisper and you can hear me. It's very, very quiet, as Elmer Fudd would say. Elmer Fudd was very successful. He could probably afford an e-tron. I appreciate that designers didn't style it like a science experiment or change the controls wholesale because it's an electric vehicle. E-tron looks and operates like an Audi. Other than admiring looks, people in this nice neighborhood didn't see it as anything game-changing. Let's talk about the brakes, the pedal feel when it transitions from regenerative braking to the actual physical disc brakes is really pretty good. And there is no creep when you lift your foot from the brake the car does not move. You actually have to use the accelerator pedal. Now, this doesn't have anything like one pedal driving. It's just like a regular car. You have to use the brake pedal. Unlike a Power Wheels toy, e-tron's structure is majestically solid. No impact shutters, no creaks, no rattles, no wind whistling. Yes, it's expensive, but it feels that way. There's a solid suite of active electronic safety tech like emergency braking, adaptive cruise, and lane keeping. Nothing like autopilot or my favorite, super cruise. All right, let's discuss range. Again, the EPA rates e-tron at 218 miles. I'm seeing about 190. That's due in part because I tend to drive on the aggressive side. Plus, it's a little on the cold side. The average has been about 45 degrees and that affects electric vehicles. So you folks in Minnesota, take note. 190 miles a day, a charge every night, and that's nearly 70,000 miles annually. Nearly all EV charging is done at home, some 85%. A charging network is only critical if you can't charge where you live or you travel often. Know thyself. You may have heard, Audi is no slouch when it comes to interiors, and as always, this one's packed with materials that are soft to the touch. And it looks good, though it doesn't have the airy open floor plan that many EVs get. If you're lucky enough to hang out in a Q7 or Q8, the three screens will look very familiar. There's ambient LED piping starting at the premium plus trim level. An extra $4,300 buys the prestige trim line that adds a full leather interior, fragrance and ionization from the HVAC system, and better seats with a mild massage function. But these chairs that are heated and vented are perfectly wonderful. I find the deep center console with fussy cup holders annoying, but the slip-in wireless phone charging on the left works great. I've driven a number of Teslas and highly prefer Audi's setup with hard controls for important functions. It's just easier to get to things. The screens on the center stack are haptic, so they feel like pushing physical buttons. Nice feedback. Here's a crowd pleaser. People are mesmerized by the camera setup. It's actually kind of useful to check out your surroundings. The gauge cluster has a number of different settings. Chances are owners will find a setup that works well for them. The main interface has excellent touch response and a decent layout. It's simple and elegant. Android Auto and Apple CarPlay are standard and wireless. Also, the ChargePoint apps work nicely within CarPlay to find stations. A 3D sound Bang & Olufsen audio system is well done. Tiny gripes are door pockets that don't get mouse fur lining and a large sunroof that could be even more panoramic. One thing that I'm really curious about, why I'm so much better looking? No, headroom. Oh, because of the sport back roof line, it's not much of an issue. We're both five foot nine. I have that much and knee, leg and foot room, all pretty darn generous. Cushions are high enough so that thigh support is excellent. And the door openings are big enough. Car seats go in and out. Not much of a problem there. Door pockets, those are pretty big. Oh, one thing I'll say about the back windows, they don't roll down very far, do they? That said, everybody will be able to charge their phones. There's dual zone climate control back here, plus heated seats, yay. Also, not just curtain airbags, side torso bags. Those are optional. Floor's nice and flat. That's nice when you have three people, feet aren't crowded, and really three adults will be okay back here. Etron is really pretty roomy. 
As for design, the e-tron Sportback is a handsome machine. It looks like an Audi, and at the end of any day, that's a good thing. There are small little flourishes that my camera doesn't pick up, which give it interest and keep it from being dull. That's a hallmark of the brand. Uh, talk to any designer. It's hard to make clean design interesting. This Seattle guy wants a wiper for the back glass, especially with that degree of rake. Speaking of, I see the preference for the Sportback and the standard roofline to be a personal choice. I found a non-Sportback e-tron in my neighborhood. Here's a comparison so you don't have to switch to Doug's channel. Just a little service I provide. I find the standard roofline to work better overall. Uh, maybe I'm just traditional. Naturally, the Sportback design is going to take some cargo room away from the traditional e-tron roofline, and this one is more expensive. Thanks, Audi, for including a spare tire. There's room left for some of my gear, too. The security panel that I didn't shoot won't fit under the floor, but it does lay on top. There are the expected doodads back here, too. But no remote seat releases? This is a premium SUV, after all. At least it's usable with 40-20-40 split seats, and as far as cargo space goes, it's not really that much smaller. There's 27.2 cubic feet with the back seat usable, compared to 28.5. But I'm guessing that the roof line still affects utility. Sportback takes on seven packs of softness and absorbency. The standard e-tron should swallow up eight. In case there's any doubt that the hatch won't close, Really? You think I'd let that slide? It has to close for the test. Well, that covers the Audi e-tron Sportback. Let's wrap things up with red light, green light. Green light. E-tron has the attributes that make electric vehicles awesome. Instant torque, low center of gravity, and a whisper quiet cabin that gets excellent Audi grade materials. After the federal tax credit, this is $3,000 less than a Q8. Plus, it's less expensive to fuel and maintain. This heavyweight is surprisingly nimble, and the chassis is Golden Gate Bridge solid. Yellow lights? It's quick, yes, but if you drag race a Tesla Model Y, you'll lose. If you prefer the Sportback design, it's more expensive, with a little less utility. There's a charging network through Electrify America and others, but it's not as robust and easy to use as Tesla supercharging if you need it often. Red lights. Organizing things in the deep center console is a fussy affair, and cup holders that don't hold well are no help. A top charging rate of 150 kilowatts is not competitive for a premium EV. And while the realistic 218 mile range is all most people really need, 300 seems to be the magic security blanket number for many buyers. An extended range all-wheel drive Ford Mustang Mach-E can go 270 miles on a charge, and it easily costs 14 grand less than e-tron. Plus, rear drive models shave 2,700 bucks off that price while bumping range to 300 miles. It doesn't have the Audi grade cabin though, so there's that. Yeah, I'm well aware that Tesla claims a long range Model Y will go some 326 miles on a charge. But word on the street is the real world range isn't anywhere close to that. I highly suggest that you check with Tesla forums if that is one of the reasons why you're buying a Tesla. Nothing against Tesla, I'm just saying, check. What the e-tron lacks in range, it makes up with the Audi experience. That means exceptional craftsmanship and balanced design. If you enjoyed your Power Wheels experience as a kid, the e-tron will be a jolt to the senses. FYI, if owners get stranded, all e-trons receive free roadside assistance to help get them juiced up again. And e-tron comes with seven days of silver car rental, handy for owners nervous about going very long distances in more rural areas where charging networks aren't built out. Everyone wants to know why I don't drive Tesla cars. Well, actually I do. Many of my wealthy friends have them and I have access. I just don't produce videos. Why? Because A, Tesla is very hard to work with. B, they offer no press vehicles. It doesn't even have a PR staff. C, I spend days shooting and evaluating cars to give you insight. That makes it hard to borrow someone's personal ride. And D, my insurance rider doesn't cover borrowing personal cars. Yeah, I have a lot of expenses to cover. But as a one-man operation, I love doing this video series. Driven is my labor 
labor of love, my passion. I take it very seriously since I have the privilege to drive all sorts of awesome cars. I feel responsible to give you great photography, editing, and insight. It's like hanging out with friends over a cup of coffee or a beer. Speaking of friends, Rob Calero helped by driving this week so I can shoot the running footage. Oh, and check out my price quote service, quotes.driven.ws, or use another quote service to get real-world pricing, since many rebates and dealer incentives are hidden. But using mine supports my endeavor to give you the best video reviews on the interwebs. Uh, these days, a vehicle might be your most expensive purchase, since many people can't afford real estate. It's sky high, which is kind of sad. At the very least, you get immediate invoice pricing info for free, and that should help your dealings. Hope you got something out of my look at the Audi e-tron Sportback. This is the end. Time for the fun fact. You do know what the Audi logo means, right? Uh, back in the late 1920s, there were four German automakers that were having financial troubles, so they banded together to become one. Each of those rings represents each of those companies. And here's another one for you. In Latin, Audi means listen. And a lot of people don't know that Mercedes actually owned Audi for a brief period of time, the late 50s, early 60s. So many fun facts. Thanks for sticking around to the very end, folks. That's Driven. I'm Tom Volk.